After the Civil War, many farmers were in need of laborers and both African American and whites sought the opportunity for work. The lack of cash or individual credits led to the creation of sharecropping in the 1870s. Sharecropping then began to dominate the South as one of the only forms of work that people could find after the Civil War. Sharecropping was a simple concept except the only person truly benefiting was the planter. Sharecroppers hardly ever made any profit from their work, but relied on any type of income to support their wives and children. Sharecroppers would rent the equipment, supplies, and a home just big enough for their families from the farmer in order to get started with the planting season. Sharecroppers would then plant the seed and be in charge of the crop until it needed to be harvested sometime in the fall. After the crop was harvested by the sharecroppers, it could then be sold. Nearly all the profit was given back to the planters, and anything the sharecropper received often went back to the planters in order to pay back the money borrowed to rent equipment and supplies from the start of the season. Higher interest rates, unpredictable harvests, and landlords that just wanted their crops made it difficult for sharecroppers to sell their crops. The landlords most of the time had the debt carried on to the next year. Laws that were passed favoring the landlords made it illegal and almost impossible for sharecroppers to sell their crops to other buyers besides their landlords. It also prevented sharecroppers from moving if they were indebted to their landlords. Life for sharecroppers were difficult, even under the best situation. The sharecroppers lived in a house, but the house was on land that they didn't own. At any time, the landlord could evict the sharecroppers and give them no reason why. Sharecropping in some situations could end up having to pay fees and split their profit they made. The landowners that owned the land divided the land into about 50 acre plots. On those 50 acres, the sharecroppers get a cabin, supplies, and they use the land for farming. The arrangement was the sharecroppers had to give the landowners 50% of the crops harvested off the land. Sharecropping was difficult for Americans because for all their hard work, the sharecroppers never earned money, or the owners were never paid in cash. Most of the time, sharecroppers would pay back in the crops they produce. Often one half or one third of the crops the sharecroppers harvested was given back to the farmers for the debt they had. Sharecropping on small farms was not the easiest. Sharecropping led many Americans to start to plant cotton, which in the end led to an overproduction in cotton, which made prices decrease and sales decrease, which then led to the farms losing money because all their crops wasn't selling. For over 60 years, their system kept many farmers living close to poverty with a small chance of achieving success and being able to own their own farm. Finally, on a cold winter morning of January 10, 1939, over 1,500 families, both black and white, began to pile their belongings on the roadside of Highway 61. The sharecroppers took part in a roadside protest after they no longer had housing or could afford to take care of their families as a result of disease, drop of crop prices, and simple inhuman treatment by their landowners. Landowners began firing sharecroppers and replacing them with day laborers in order to keep subsided giving to sharecroppers after the Agricultural Adjustment Act. This left thousands without the guarantee of housing or supplies they counted on in order to provide for their families. It did not take more than a day before pictures of the sharecroppers and their protests under the Southern Tent Farmers Union began to headline newspapers nationally wide. Owen Whitfield, the preacher and leader of the 1939 sharecropper strike, stated what was going to happen to the news reporters, but most importantly to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Whitfield and 350 people gathered at the Sykeston First Baptist Church to hold one final rally. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch sent Sam Armstrong to cover the protests. With Sam Armstrong in attendance, Whitfield knew he had the chance to explain to the public the moral importance of the protest before planters disnounced it. Res reporters that had been tipped off by Whitfield were there to cover the whole strike and how it went down. Sharecroppers were evicted from their homes, which they had no rights as homeowners or renters. 
In 1931, there was a New Deal Act passed, which in the act gave farmers the funds to pay the sharecroppers that lived on their land. Already alerted by Armstrong's report, the Post-Dispatch, along with the Missouri Papers and the Association Press, sent corresponding and photographers to the scene. By the morning of January 11th, their descriptions of the protests, both written and photographed, appeared in newspapers across the country, including the M Memphis Business Appeal, the New York Times, and Daily Workers. On the morning of January 13th, the Shearcroppers camps were declared unsanitary. Shortly after, the Missouri State Highway Patrol began to evict the Shearcroppers from the camps. The Highway Patrol moved the Shearcroppers and their families to concentration camps all around the Boot Hill. On January 31, 1939, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt stated in her newspaper column while her and President Roosevelt were assisting the strike. The winter which started out so kindly has turned out to be a hard winter after all. Those of us who have a warm place to sleep, plenty of clothing, and enough food, so really not concerned beyond a mild desire to see the sun now and then. However, I cannot help but wonder about the sharecroppers, families in Missouri. I fear that human suffering is not confined to Europe these days. Once the government agents began to arrive, the sharecropping knew that it was time for their demands to be heard. Many of the sharecroppers wanted the government to establish a settlement like they had in 1937. Some wanted to go on their own and get their own land, and others wanted the opportunity to work. Elijah Moore stated, Give me land and I'll make a living like no other. Sharecropping was bad for slavery because it increased the debt that poor people own to the plantation owners. Sharecropping was also similar to slavery because after a long period of time, the sharecroppers owed so much money to the plantation owners that they had to give them all by the money that they made from cotton. The sharecropping system kept farmers in poverty. The issue was a big negative that sharecropping had on Amer African Americans. The freedom men found that freedom could make the folks proud, but it didn't make them rich. Even though sharecropping was just like slavery, it was a different form. The tentative adjusted that slavery was free from tenant, but not free for slaves. So when sharecropping was a new form of slavery, it still wasn't something to be proud of, but the good thing is that sharecroppers were free unlike slavery when they weren't. William H. Jones stated to the media, We don't know whether this will do us any good, but it will show the people what we're up against. <laughs>